All right, guys, this is the last day of notes, and we're going to cover the end of World War I and how it ends. So uh, if you've been down here, this is, I mentioned this in class, this is the Liberty Memorial, and this is actually the National World War I Museum, and part of the reason it's in Kansas City is that we offered to build a, a memorial to the war just three years after, raised all the funds, and it was built in Kansas City, and it is the official World War I Museum, and it's in our own hometown. All right, so... <clears throat> Remember when we talked a few days ago, um, when Woodrow Wilson uh, got America into war, part of the reason was he wanted to come up with a plan to end it. So um, we have a meeting in Versailles, uh, the old palace where the French kings used to reside, uh, and we have the big four. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, this is uh, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, Woodrow Wilson obviously of the United States, and then here we have Georges Clemenceau and David Lloyd George of Great Britain and France. So the big four are the ones who are going to meet. Uh, Wilson came with his 14 points, and this was on our crash course that we had. Uh, 14 points was basically his 14 you know, ideas for ending the war. Uh, one through five, talk about eliminating the causes of war. Six through 13, talk about self-determination. And then the most important point, 14, creates a League of Nations. And that was part of uh, Wilson's plan was to create this you know, big, world gathering place where the sides could meet and hopefully prevent wars from happening okay so preserve peace and prevent future wars now the problem that happens is wilson has this plan the italians want territory they join the war on the allied side because they want a territory from austria great britain wants uh germany to be punished for all the bloodshed from four years as does france Plus, France wants to get back some territory that Germany had taken. So that is the problem we have, is you've got Wilson, who, you know, is looking for, you know, preservation of peace and preventing future wars, and the other three who have their own interests and really don't care much about any of that stuff. So um, the 14 points mostly get rejected as too lenient. So when the Treaty of Versailles is concluded, which will be, you know, based on the 14 points, uh, it will blame Germany, which is not what Wilson wanted, but that was part of the deal. Wilson... Uh, agreed to that because the French and uh, British demanded that it be in there. So Germany was given the entire blame for the war. Reparations would have to be paid by both the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was going to be broken up, and by the Germans. Um, it created a number of new nations, especially in southeastern Europe. And, as we know, one of the big failures is it was so punishing to Germany that it will give rise to Nazism. Part of the reason that Hitler capitalizes on convincing Germans that they should join the Nazi party was by saying, look at what happened in the peace agreement. We were blamed for everything, which of course we know is not true. There were a lot of factors involved. It wasn't just Germany's fault. All right, so <clears throat> Wilson gets the treaty done, which he wasn't happy, but then he brings it home. And the American people and the American government uh, leaders in Congress did not like it. Okay, um, <clears throat> one of the guys, one of the major leaders was um, Henry Cabot Lodge, and he was called the one of the irreconcilables. And think about Lodge's. What we know is he didn't really like Wilson. He felt that Wilson thought he was better than everybody. He had a personal dislike for uh, the president, and you know didn't really want to enact what Wilson wanted. Wilson was a Democrat. He was a Republican. So when Congress gets back, they said we will not approve the Treaty of Versailles. So. Um, we did not approve the Treaty of Versailles. So technically, we were still at war until we signed separate peace agreements, which wouldn't happen until 1921. So that is the one interesting thing is the Treaty of Versailles was ratified and passed everywhere except for the United States. Okay, So um, Wilson traveled the country trying to get people to uh, you know, pressure their congressmen to sign it. Um, he was, in some cases, giving speeches in multiple cities in one day. I think I read somewhere he gave in one day like four or five speeches in four or five different cities, traveling by train. And we know this will become a bad thing for him because it's going to lead him to overwork and eventually lead to his stroke. All right, so the economic turmoil that will follow after the war is also going to be a black mark. So right about the same time that Wilson is, you know, traveling, trying to convince people to, to you know, pressure their congressmen to pass the Treaty of Versailles, um, we have inflation, post-war inflation, which causes the cost of living to go up. Jobs are scarce. Uh, now, during the war years, the unions had gained power, but part of the deal was they had agreed not to strike. Once the war is over, and that is not a misprint, we had 3,600 strikes between the end of the war in November of 1918 and the end of 1919. So roughly 13 months 
we had 3,600 strikes. Um, the big ones, Seattle had a general strike in which multiple industries, like the steel industry, the shipping industry, multiple industries all went on strike at the same time and basically shut down the entire city. Lasted for five days. A lot of Americans really felt like, you know, it could lead to pure anarchy. Uh, in Boston, the police had not been given a pay increase in a long time, so 75% of the police officers went on strike. Um, this obviously did not go over well because obviously criminals thought, hmm. <laughs> yeah, so uh, they called out the military and they basically forced the police to work and those who wouldn't were fired. And um, the famous quote uh, you see here is from Calvin Coolidge, future president Calvin Coolidge, who was the governor at the time, who said that you have no right to strike against public safety at any time. Basically, public employees can't strike, and that's our rule here in Missouri. Um, teachers were considered public employees, so we can't strike. And then there was a major steel strike. U.S. Steel broke the union, and there was a number of violent clashes that led to injuries and deaths. <sighs> Excuse me for that. Sorry, a little allergies. Uh, societal problems. We also had the uh, unrest uh, break out over you know the economic situation in the country. Uh, there were 25 race riots that broke out in 1919. They called it Red Summer. Now we talked about this a little bit in the first unit. Um, the worst was in Chicago and part of the reason is that um, as soldiers, many whites return home, uh, they return home to find their jobs gone. They've been you know lost to uh, African-American workers and women workers and uh, in the South, soldiers, black soldiers came home with medals they had earned in the war and uh, there was a series of riots that broke out largely in rural areas. There were some in big cities too, like Chicago had the biggest one, but a lot of the, uh, what, the Red Summer riots actually took place in rural areas and it was partially because of African Americans, you know, trying to express their rights and express the freedom that they had gained and didn't go over well. Uh, we also have the Red Scare. Now this had nothing to do with the Red Summer. Red Summer was because of all the blood. Uh, Red Scare was communists, okay? So in 1917, remember, the communist revolution had occurred in the Soviet Union or in Russia, and Lenin took over and created the Bolshevik Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR. Well, then there was a fear that communists were going to seize power all over the world. Um, part of the uh, idea of the takeover in Russia was what was called the common turn, the communist international. And they basically said, you know, all over the world, overthrow your governments and put in a communist government. So there were fears that communists were going to seize power. There was panic. A lot of it was tied to immigrants. Um, yes, we had an anarchist movement, but the anarchist movement was not really linked with the, you know, Red Scare. Uh, though it got linked, but they really did not work together. Uh, we did see a series of bombings, which they think were done by anarchists, and in response to that, uh, the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, who had been targeted in one of the bombings, is going to start what were called the Palmer Raids. He uh, started raiding houses looking for uh, suspected communists, uh, reports that you know there were guns everywhere. Uh, the Palmer Raids, by the way, were very ineffective. They literally found four guns, and I think three of them had been purchased legally. Uh, the guy who led those Palmer raids is a name that we'll talk about a lot this semester, J. Edgar Hoover, who was leader of the FBI, and we'll talk about him when we get the Civil Rights Movement. Um, they also targeted foreigners. A lot of them were deported, and a lot of civil liberties were ignored. They used the Sedition Act and the Espionage Act. So, by the time we get to the election of 1920, we have um, disillusionment, economic problems, labor unrest, racial tensions, World War I, the memories of the deaths of that, we had the flu pandemic we talked about first semester, and remember, Woodrow Wilson had his stroke, so we had, for a while, for much of 1919, no president. So uh, the progressive ideas seem to be going by the wayside. So as we know, um, Warren G. Harding will campaign on a, what he called a return to normalcy, and he will be elected in the landslide in 1920, and that's really what we remember about World War One is the, uh, you know, turning away, hey, the war's over, Versailles didn't work, we're going to move on and you know, focus on our economy. All right, here's your questions. Why were the British and French angry about the 14 points? Two, why was Germany angry about the Treaty of Versailles? Three, why did America never ratify the League of Nations? Four, what was the Red Scare? Five, what was the Red Summer? And six, why was Harding elected in 1920? All right, that is it for notes. And, um, and again, when I get back on Monday, I'll make sure and <clears throat> go over these again too, just some of the major high points. All right, have a good weekend.